chapter 2, and we're in verses 12 through 24 this morning, which I will read in just a moment. You got it? It's great to see you all this morning. So, um, the, the theme of our entire sermon series on Romans uh, is God's righteousness revealed, right? That's what we're just saying that this is, uh, there's many ways to sort of encapsulate the book, but if you're trying to figure out, hey, what's Romans doing or what's Romans about, it's the righteousness of God is revealed. And we've talked about uh, the, the, uh, early on in chapter one, the righteous one being revealed, right? God being revealed in Jesus Christ. Uh, God's righteous longings being revealed in terms of longing for the gospel and longing for the truth and longing for service and longing through prayers and partnership uh, with and for the church at Rome uh, for the sake of the gospel. And of course, we got to the place where the sort of the theme verse of the book, as it's classically stated, right, is that God is, is that God's righteousness is revealed. Right? The righteous of God is revealed from faith for faith because the righteous shall live by faith. And this is the gospel, which is the power of salvation for everyone who will believe in it. But the truth that God is the righteous judge is connected to our text. Right? It plainly, the text tells us this morning that that the righteousness of God is the standard for judgment. That the mere hearers of the word are not righteous for God, but the doers are justified. And uh, this this idea is the same, uh, same for righteousness and justified is the same in the Greek. The root is the same. First is the noun, the second is the verb. And so as I read this passage this morning, and we've been talking about the, 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 the judgment of God over the last several weeks. Just bear in mind that while God's judgment is sure and true, it's also not without the context of the righteous judge doing what is good and right. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent, Because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. God righteously judges all sinners and their secrets. God righteously judges all the sinners' secrets. 
as we said, this, this righteous judge, God is the, is the one perfect righteous judge, is simply there in our text. It's his righteousness that is the standard for judgment. Nobody else. The hearers of the word are not righteous, meaning they're just taking in information, but the doers of the word are the ones who are justified, meaning those who are actually not only hearing God's word, but believing God's word and, 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 and acting on it, living according to it, desiring it in soul and in their actions. So the logical conclusion and the breadth of the scripture teach us that if God is desiring righteousness from us, he himself must be righteous. God of all gods must be perfectly perfect. David writes in the Psalms, uh, chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O oh, righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, and a God who feels indignation every day. Even, even, that's the Old Testament, even the New Testament, even Jesus himself describes himself as, as the one who will judge, right? In Matthew 19, verse 28, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, the Son of Man is himself, and Jesus knows he's the Son of Man, and he's the one who's going to sit on the glorious throne. He'll be the one who judges over. This is really important. It's really important. If you are a follower of Christ, you... By, by authority of the word of God, the revelation of Christ, um, through the power of the Holy Spirit, writing through human men to human beings, you have to believe that God is righteous. You have to. You have to trust. And I, not, not just go, oh, well, that's what the Christians believe, but that's what I believe. That's what I'm convinced of. God is perfectly perfect. He's righteous above all else. That he is righteous in his nature and his character. I was talking with a group of pastors, uh, a small group of pastors recently, last few months, and um, we were talking in, in, in uh, we we're talking like, what's the most important attribute of God? And in some ways, it's kind of a, it's, I mean, sometimes it's kind of a silly argument, right? You're like, okay, well, you know, how do we know what the most important attribute of God is? He's God, and he's the perfection of all the attributes, and they all seem to be necessary for him to be perfectly righteous. So in that sense, there's that. But it, but it also seems to me <clears throat> that, that if God um, it has all these attributes perfectly, right? if we think he has these attributes, we believe he has all these attributes, whatever they might be, but we're not confident that he's righteous. We're not confident that he's righteous. We're not confident that he is holy. We're not confident. We don't believe that he's perfectly perfect then there's a, there's a crack in the door, right? There's a little space there. It remains open for him to not be perfect in all the rest of the attributes, his omniscience or his omnipresence or his loving kindness or his forbearance or whatever, whatever nature or character the scriptures ascribe to who God is. If he's, not, if he's not first and foremost holy in his nature where he's perfectly perfect, then there's a chance that something might be going awry or amiss with God in the way he acts for us for his glory. It generally does, does not in a, it generally does not come out for us in a holistic rejection of God if we don't believe in the perfection of his nature and character. But, but I think it does begin to erode our understanding of what he commands of us. We begin to be lax, or maybe God's not doing it quite right, or maybe in our lack of understanding of his ways, we're not confident any longer that his ways are the perfect ways for us when things don't go the way that we thought they ought to go. We must believe that he's perfectly righteous in, in who he is as God. And then we must trust Christ's righteous actions, including his judgment. If he's perfectly perfect in who he is, then he's perfectly perfect in all that he does. And this is easy to say when the work that he does is positive. 
right? When we say God is loving, we're like, yeah, man, God's perfectly loving. It's wonderful. When we say God, when we sing that God saves us, that he brings us up out of the grave, we're like, yeah, man, he does it perfectly. There's nothing he has, nothing he can't save me from, nothing he hasn't saved me out of. That's what he does. It's who he is. It's wonderful. But when the actions of God from our eyes are negative, or when the actions of God in our eyes are undesirable, then we are apt to begin to question God where we waver in our faith that he is perfectly perfect in his nature and character. And I think it's good for us to make the connection this morning that when we are questioning God's actions in our lives, we are either intentionally or unintentionally also questioning the character of God. And if we're not serving a perfect God, then we're serving no God at all. We are to trust, right? When we read these first two verses, right? when it comes to God's judgment, right? Because that seems to be a negative thing. That, that for us, from our perspective, that, that a loving God of the universe, the creating God of the universe would, would say, would, would, would by his own words say that those that don't follow him are condemned to eternal, everlasting, painful judgment. Perhaps even those that are close to us, family or co-workers or Neighbors that are just good folk that have helped you out, but yet don't profess Jesus Christ. It's hard for us to conceptualize sometimes that like this is a right thing when that person has been in their own, in their own righteousness, has been kind to us or loving to us or provided for us. But we don't need to question God at this juncture. We need to trust that he is good and right and just, even in his judgment. We also need to take note of the law. In verse 14, this is the first time that the law is mentioned in the book of Romans. And if you'll stick with us, if you'll plow through Romans with us over the course of the next year or so, maybe two, could be three, You're just going to see the the theme of the law of God just all throughout the book of Romans. Paul is going to keep talking about it in different ways. But here, the first time he brings it up, he's drawing our attention to the Jews who are under the law. And 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 at this juncture, I literally believe what he means is the Jews are under these first five books, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, also known as the Pentateuch, right? The Penta, five, Tuke, teachings or something, I think is what it is. I think I forgot Tuke, but I'll, I'll work on it and get back to you next week. But these first five books, right, these first five writings, this is what Paul's talking about. The Jews are under this, these first five books. And the Gentiles, they also have a law. And it's, it's here that we can see that the, that the law does not save them. And we'll get it more in the next point, but there's other places in in Paul's writings where we can see that the law clearly will not save, whether that law is the first five books or as for the Gentiles, right, as we're going to see, it's it's what's in their heart. No matter what the law, no matter what the law is, the law won't save you. So Romans 3, 19 and 20 say, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified, will be made righteous in God's sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Again, to the church at Corinth, in the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, he writes to the Jews, I became as a Jew, uh, as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law... The Jews, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law. Paul's meaning he's following the way, though his heart is not judged by the law. His righteousness doesn't come through the law. He's not under it. He's under Christ. 
He said that I might win those under law. I'm becoming more like them so they can see that I appreciate where they're coming from, but also to show them there's something far better than the law to save them. To those outside the law, the Gentiles, I became as one outside the law. So he didn't live by the Jewish laws with the Gentiles, but, but though he was not outside the law of God, but where? He was under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. Galatians 3, 23, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So the law won't save you. You need to trust Christ's righteous judgment. Uh, and, but but and knowing the law won't save you, but, but Jesus can, right? Because what does Jesus do with the law? Jesus comes and he fulfills the law. He says in, Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Hey, church, imagine just for a second, if Jesus had come and lived and died, and you had no knowledge of the law whatsoever, like the Old Testament didn't exist. Just imagine it in your head for a second. Jesus just showed up and said, I'll save you and I'm, I'm going to die and rise again for you, but you had zero context of the Old Testament. What would it mean? What, how, how would you be able to ascertain how the, 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 the depths of the meaning of what took place or even just the, the baseline meaning of what it would take? We, we, we wouldn't. He'd be teaching us afresh and anew, but instead what Jesus is saying, I'm coming and die for you. I'm going to be the sacrificial lamb for your sins, just like the Old Testament law told you you needed. We need, so, it, you know, so instead of saying we no longer need the law, that's a big mistake. If you're, if you're hearing a teacher or a preacher of any, of any sort and they say, hey, pfft, don't, that Old Testament stuff, don't worry about it. Just follow Jesus. You'll be fine. Man, run. Like run, put, you know, tie them up, tie them up and sprint. Because that person's lopping off the fulfillment, the, the, the very thing that Jesus came to fulfill. So you've got to have both. So instead of saying we no longer need the law or the Pentateuch or the Old Testament in general, we say we absolutely need it to understand God's holiness, to understand our sin and what the purpose of the cross of Christ is. And Hebrews helps us get there, right? Verses 9, Hebrews 9, 22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Old Testament helps us see we need a shedding of blood, but we need a sacrifice that's absolutely unlike all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. We need a perfect lamb to save us from our sins. It goes on in the same chapter, verses 27 and 28, and just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. Church, all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law. And all those who have sinned under the law will be judged by that law. Everybody is judged by a perfectly righteous God unto a perfectly holy end, and that's his glory. And as Christians, we confess this. As followers of Christ, we believe this. We do not shy away from the judgment of God. We are humbled by it and excruciatingly thankful that he delivered us from it. And we trust him, whether we can understand it fully or not, whether, whether our emotions get tangled up or not, we supersede our emotions with trust in Christ that he is doing it perfectly. Christ judges perfectly. And Christ judges all the sinners. This is what verses 14 through 24 are teaching us. He's judging all the sinners. Verses 14 and 15 and 16 are playing on those who, in verse, as verse 12 started out with, those who don't have the law. And verses 17 through 24 are specifically speaking to those who have the law, the Jewish Christians who are in the context of the church at Rome. So we know for sure that he's judging all those who are not Jews. 
right? Or Jewish Christians. Gentiles do not have. They have not been given. They do not follow the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. The Gentiles have no need for them whatsoever in, in their own minds, in their own hearts, from their own perspective. Gentiles do act by their nature. Verse 14, when Gentiles who don't have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. So they do act by their nature uh, with general, sort of covered by the general grace of God, right? In ways, they act in ways that are consistent with the law. They do right things. They refrain from doing wrong things. Gentiles, unbelievers, no context of God. But it's by this that we that Paul tells us that we know they have the law written on their hearts, right? That's verse 15. When they act in alignment with the law, though they don't have the law, it helps us to understand that the law is written on their hearts. Now, we'll be very careful about this verse just for a quick second. So follow along, class, okay? There are other places in the Scripture that talk about the law being written on their hearts. I'm going to point two of them to you. But both of those are in a very positive sense. Here we're talking about the law on their hearts in a negative sense, as in the law will judge them, even though they don't have the law. It's with them for their judgment. As opposed to, maybe you've heard a verse uh, like Jeremiah 31, 33, where there is a new covenant synonymous with a new law that is written on the hearts of those who are his people. We, we, we use that verse with some regularity, right? It's pointing to this new covenant, this, this, the coming of Christ from Jeremiah. Oh, there's a new law, there's a new covenant. It's written on our hearts. Not the same thing as Romans, Romans 2. Uh, or perhaps you've read uh, 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, where the church at Corinth is described as a, the church themselves is described as a letter from Christ delivered by Paul. And that letter is not written with ink, nor is that letter that is the church written on tablets of stone, but that letter that describes the church is written with the Spirit on tablets of the human hearts. That's a positive thing, okay? The church, the church is the letter being written by the Spirit on human hearts. But that's not this. In our passage, it's not salvation nor condemnation, but it's justified condemnation as the work of the law to show their sinfulness is revealed by a threefold witness. Look at your text again. Look at verse 15. This work is written on their hearts, right? There's a place where where this condemnation is justified, where they understand what's going on. And while it's written on their hearts, it's while their conscience also bears witness. So it's written on my heart. My conscience is being bearing witness to it. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day uh, when, when Christ judges. So the, the Gentiles are not without witness. Their actions display truths they see in the law, and their hearts and their conscience and their thoughts reveal these things to them. And what we learned in chapter 1 is that these people suppress the truth. So any time in their life when sinfulness is coming up in their hearts or their thoughts or their conscience, either by culture or by their own sinful heart or both, they're just saying, no, 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 I'm okay. I don't need Jesus. Like, I'm bad. I did something wrong, but I'm not going to go to hell for it. Like, I'm okay. I'll just I'll keep plugging forward. And in doing this, they're denying their creator, they're denying their savior, and they're suppressing the truth that Christ needs to save them. And notice again in that verse, in verse 15, it's all legal language as to show the work of the law is to demonstrate or appeal to the fact of that what is written on their hearts, it's, it's bearing, so there's the written on their hearts, it's bearing witness, that's, that's legal language, right? And their thoughts are conflicted between legal accusation of their sins, which would bring them guilt, or excuse, or which is actually like the legal defense, literally the legal defense, in order to relieve their own guilt, their their thoughts are, are they're, they're conflicting because they either accuse them and they feel guilty or they're excusing them to say, no, I, I don't need it. All of this is happening to the Gentiles, to those who don't believe, who are now under the Lord's mercy, but will be finally judged by God's righteousness through the person of Jesus Christ. You see it? If you can see it a little bit, at least say Amen. 
Okay. But not only is he going to judge the Jew, the Gentile, he's going to judge the Jew as well. So there's two if clauses in 17 through 24. And those two if clauses have 12 criteria for the purpose of def- defining who the Jews say they are and accusing them of what they're not doing. Right? So the first if clause right there, but if you, right? And it's about their, and this first if clause is about their internal righteousness, either by position or by action. If you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law, if you boast in God, if you know his will, if you approve what is excellent, if you are instructed from the law, if this is who you are, then the second if clause is about what they're doing outside themselves, right? It's it's about their role as God's witness to the rest of the world. If you are sure you're a guide to the blind, if you are a light to the darkness, if you are an instructor of the foolish, if you're a teacher of children, if you embody as an example knowledge and truth. See, because the Jews were created by God in order to be the revelation of Yahweh God, Jehovah God, to the rest of the known world. That was their job. Isaiah 42 teaches the Jews and Gentiles that the Jews must be a light to the nations. Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations. The covenant I'm giving you is a light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. You, you can see that Paul is, is, is accusing them. Like you're saying you are all these things. This is what God designed you to be and you are resting solely on your position and place as the people of God. And once he gets through these, these two if clauses... He turns it in verse 21, and he gives them these four questions that are an indictment of their hypocrisy. Ah, so you're the guide to the blind. You're the teachers of the children. All references to people outside Israel, outside the Jewish nation. You teach others, but do you teach yourself? You preach against stealing, but don't you steal? You tell people not to commit adultery, but aren't you yourself committing adultery? You say you abhor idols, but you are robbing the temple. And so verse 23 then, it literally says, he gives a summary idea, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. Or or just quite literally in the Greek, you who boast in the law by breaking the law dishonor God. They are literally blaspheming God to the very people they're supposed to be witnessing to by boasting in their privilege of being Jews or Jewish Christians and then breaking the law. God will judge them if they're resting in their own place. So, what are we to do with all this information the pastor just gave us from verses 14 to 24. What do we do with all this? What are we to learn? How are we to grow? What are we, what are we to do with Christ? Lesson number one, there's no excuse. He judges everybody. If you are a Gentile, the law is on your heart. If you are a Jew, the law is written and, and given specifically for you first, right? Twice in, the, in our passages so far. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Just it's order. Thus, if you are here this morning, there are, there are now, uh, spiritually speaking, there's only the, uh, there, there's, there's, and you are an unbeliever in Christ, whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether whatever categories you want to put everybody into, I just need you to hear the Bible say, hear King Jesus say, There's no excuse for not trusting in the righteousness of Christ for your salvation. If you are not a believer, you were born a sinner, and your heart and actions bear out that you are a sinner. And I believe if you are honest with yourself, if you're here this morning and you're sure you're not a Christian, if you will just be honest with yourself, 
You know there's a creator who made you and there's a savior who died for you and your heart is telling you this and your conscience is bearing witness to the truth of God's righteousness and and how he defines right and wrong and your thoughts, according to the word of God, your thoughts are either leaving you guilty this morning or your thoughts are bearing excuse as to why you're not following Jesus Christ. And I tell you very lovingly, turn to Jesus Turn to Jesus Christ and follow him alone and let him undo the burden of your hearts and your thoughts and your conscience. And if you're here this morning and you say that you're a believer, right? But the reality is you're not because you're basically living as, as out of a position of privilege, you have, you have uh, been to a revival service. You have had an experience in your bedroom. You have, you have, you have come to a conclusion, right? You're like, oh, I, I'm going to go to hell. I need to be saved. And you receive that grace by faith through faith alone. But then the rest of your life, you're just doing your own thing. You're not submitting to God's word. You're not confessing your sins. You're not you're not, you're not adjusting your life so Christ is at the center of it and everything you do is around Jesus. And I'm not talking about works-based righteousness. I'm talking about responding to the love and grace of Jesus Christ that he would pour out his righteousness in your heart and it, and it gives you a burning desire to follow him. And when you don't follow him, you're undone and you confess it to him so that you can continue to follow him. So you can be forgiven and be relieved of the burden because he's already died and rose again, died for the burden, rose again to conquer the burden and you can live free in Christ, aiming to not sin again, knowing that you will sin again, but that he's always there faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is the gospel. But if you're sitting in this room and you're banking it on just some decision you made or a work that you've done or a goodness that you have by coming here, I need you to know this morning on the authority of the word of God, you are not safe. You're not safe from his judgment. Because Christianity is Christian is not what we do. It's what Christ does to us. It's not a position that we simply just are. It's not something we belong to in that sense. It's something we believe in first, that we're changed by first, and then we know we belong to Christ because we know that he has changed us. We discuss in the end of chapter one that there's not a sin under the sun, capital S-O-N or physical S-U-N, that you and I are not guilty of. James tells us that if you or I have broken one piece of the law, just one simple part of it, you have broken all of the law. The whole point of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was to tell us that, (laughs) that, that we are as sinful as we could possibly be, that we take pride that we haven't committed adultery, we take pride that we haven't murdered someone, we take pride that we're not thieves, and yet, and yet in our hearts, in our hearts, we're adulterers just by the mere lust. We're murderers by mere anger. We're thieves simply by sins of omission because we rob God of his glory but not giving him all of our life every moment of every day. We're no better than anybody you can think of. But we're deeply grateful that Jesus Christ died for us, and we respond to him by faith alone, through grace alone. I'm sure, I'm sure you have heard the news that Tim Keller passed away. And praise God for men like him who gave themselves up and who worked hard and studied hard and found people around him that were good at what he wasn't good at so that his good teaching of the gospel could go forth to all kinds of people, all kinds of countries and all those kinds of things. It's wonderful. And while we'll miss him, he's not missing us at all, I promise. He's just, he's just staring at Jesus wide-eyed and just, woo, just, just as ecstatic as he's ever been. Just, and, and, and now he understands, oh, Oh, this is what it's like. And he's like, he's like, oh, I don't have my resurrected body yet. I'm waiting. Like he's just looking at Jesus, waiting for a new body. It's all, it's all he's doing right now. He's good. 
He knows the Lord's got the church. But we're thankful for dudes like him and all that came before him, known and unknown. But he's, but he's famous. He's, one of the things he's famous for saying, I've quoted it here many times, but it's good just to be thankful for a good saint in the Lord. Just through one of his quotes that we've all, all can, can bear witness to. He said, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Church, may we not dare take advantage of that love and acceptance that Christ has so beautifully, graciously, horribly on the cross, unmatchably by any other God in the universe, bought for us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He judges righteously all people and even their secrets. Just go back to verse 16. On that day when, according to my gospel, and when Paul says my gospel, it's not the one that he wrote himself, it's not the one that he made up, it's the one that he was delivered by, that it possesses him even as he has it. God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Ooh, judges my secrets. Now, this is the verse that makes everybody suspicious of everybody else. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we just want to give you good news. Our church is not a church of suspicion. We are not a church of policing. Uh, we don't do you know, quarterly reviews of your life to make sure you're doing the right thing. We trust that when you are sinning against the Lord, the Lord, by the power of the Spirit, will come to you, convict you of sin and judgment and righteousness, and you will confess and turn from your ways. And we trust that there's something that you cannot turn away from yourself, that you will go and confess it to someone, and that that person will help you get through it. And we trust that if you refuse to, to follow the Lord's counsel, the Holy Spirit's leading, the good church's stuff, then we trust that the church, this church particularly, will come alongside you humbly and graciously confessing that we are all sinners just like you, but you are publicly defaming the name of Jesus Christ and you need to turn away from that. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And we want to do that. But I want to speak to you on behalf of the word of God this morning about our secrets. See, because while there is a day where he will judge everything you've never told anybody, today, the word of God is already doing that for you. One of the reasons we tell you to read this regularly, daily, is so that this can expose you for the places where you deny God, where your pastor denies God with his actions. I read this so I can be corrected, so I can be trained up in truth and righteousness. Hebrews 12, 13 and 14 say, for the word of God, this written thing is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's piercing division soul of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning, here it is, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Oh, who goes around day by day? You guys never call each other and say, hey man, let's go get a, let's go get a beer together and let me just share with you the intentions and thoughts of my heart tonight. Yeah, none, none of our men are doing that. You need to start though. Dang it, find a person, start that stuff. Ladies, you're not getting together and being like, hey, let's just get together. Let's just reveal the intentions and thoughts of our heart. We'll just confess it all right here. We ain't doing that. Nobody wants to do that. We're all like, mm -mm 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 -mm. nope. No, I got stuff to do. I got kids to drop off. I got laundry. I got secrets, hearts and thoughts and intentions. That's for later on. The word of God's already, some, some of you are not reading your Bible because you're scared of that. You're not reading your scriptures because it's going to tell you that you are who you ought not be. And that you need to do that which you don't want to do in the name of the Lord for his glory. And I want to encourage you. I want to beg you. I want to challenge you. Go home, open your Bible, and read it, and just let them speak to you. We're not coming for you. We're not knocking on your door today. There's no witch hunt here. We love you because we've been first loved by Jesus Christ. And you, we want you to know who he is. But at the final judgment, the word of God will do the same thing. Right? John 1.1. 1, 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus Christ is going to expose it all. Whatever you've hidden, whatever you've kept secret, whatever you think you're dodging, he's exposed it. He's going to expose it all. And if it's bathed in Christ's blood, then he will be the sacrifice that will atone for those secret thoughts. Those secret intentions, those false things we have in our heart. It will cover it. You might live miserably your whole your days on earth because you just keep living in secret. You might, be, you might be denouncing your faith because you're living in secret. I don't know. But you need to go before the Lord and you need to find out. Because I'm telling you, according to the word of God, that day is coming. According to the gospel, the word, Jesus Christ, will judge us for those things that nobody knows about. And without the blood of Christ, he will judge you under condemnation eternally. Hell. But if, if you will trust him, and listen, it's, I mean, in one sense, I, guess, I think I could spin this either direction, really, because in one sense, it's much easier to tell Jesus about the secrets and tensions of my heart than it is to tell my friends, right? Because he's Jesus, like he already knows it, and, he, and he already, he's already forgiven it. He's, already, he's, just, he's just waiting for us, like, mm, come on, come on, come on, just... Stop all your stuff, get on your knees, confess your sins to me. Tell me, tell me, because I'm ready to, Christ is poised to forgive. He was poised on the cross to forgive, and he's poised right now at the, at the right hand of the Father to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Just tell him. And in some way, the inverse is true. In some ways, it's easier to tell my friend because I know my friend can't judge me, right? My friend's just a sinner like I am. Now, my friend can correct me. My friend can point me to the truth of God, but they don't have the power to judge. And when I go before the word of God, well, he can bring the hammer, can't he? And he will bring the hammer, but not yet. See, here's the deal, church. When you get to that place, you won't have the opportunity. And there's actually, I've heard teachings before where people tried to spin the word of God such that everybody will go to heaven because when everybody gets to the judgment throne of God, they'll actually see the truth, they'll confess the truth, he'll save them right there and send them into eternity with him forever and nobody goes to hell. That is a false teaching. The mercy of God is for here today. The mercy of God, the grace of God, that common goodness that covers all of our world is giving you space and time to go before the Lord and tell him your secret heart's desires, your secret intentions that nobody else knows about. And he is not going to judge you under condemnation. He's going to convict you of sin and judgment and righteousness so that you will turn to him and say, please forgive me. And he will say, I'm delighted to. I'm delighted to wash you clean. I'm delighted to cleanse your guilt. I'm delighted to make you whole. I'm delighted to let you walk day by day in this life in freedom of Christ, the one that I purchased for you. You're clean, brother. You're clean, sister. You're clean, child. You're clean. But if you refuse, if you won't do that, then you will stand at the judgment seat of God And he will do the righteous work of judgment on the souls who will not turn to him. He'll expose it anyways. And he'll say, I never knew you. And you will go into eternity of death, eternity of punishment. And our church does not want that for you. There's not one person who desires that for you. Turn to God today. Repent to the righteous judge who in his goodness loves you and died for you and rose again for you. And his righteousness will judge the souls who won't follow him. I don't know what your secrets are. I can start listing a bunch of sins and see if one lands on you. I can, do you need me to, church? Do you need me to prime the pump this morning of our anger, of our bitterness, of our lust, of our pornography? of our cheating on our taxes, of our love for money, of our, our, our idols of comfort. Any of those ring a bell in your heart that you're not telling anybody about but you're living in? Confess them to the Lord. Let him forgive you.